The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Happy, happy to be here. This is my uh, first time at, at Self, but uh, I'm a, I'm, I've always been a, a Self wannabe. Um, the last two years I've wanted to come down and, and for different reasons haven't been able to make it work with my schedule, so very happy to be here for, the, for my first time. I um, want to talk a little bit today about Linux distributions, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll plug Fedora a little bit in there, but I promise I won't go over the, over the top with it. But I want to talk about how Linux distributions really help open source communities to thrive and develop. Um, so a little bit about myself, uh, like Leslie said, my name is Jared Smith. Um, somehow I ended up as the Fedora project leader. We'll talk about how I got there here in a minute. Um, but I want to start off talking about rivers. Anybody like rivers? There's my favorite river. It happens to be the Snake River in Wyoming as it goes past the Tetons there. Um, and while I want to talk about rivers, I want to use rivers as kind of an analogy as I go through my talk today. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how I got to where I am. And, 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 to, and, and so you have a little bit, bit of background about me. You know, you know who I am and why I believe what I believe. Um, I grew up in Wyoming. And for people who have never been in Wyoming, this is what it looks like most of the year. We had about nine months of winter in the little town I grew up in. In, in fact, we, uh, we used to say there was only three seasons in Wyoming. Last winter, this winter, and next winter. But for those few short, warm days during the summer, it was absolutely beautiful. And uh, I loved spending time down at the river. And I would swim in the river, and I would fish in the river, and I would float down the river on an inner, inner tube, and I would you know, make rafts and float them in the river. I, I spent all my summers down, down by the river. And I love, I love the concept of, of rivers, and they're, they're constantly flowing, and sometimes there's more water, and sometimes there's less water, but there's so many things that the, that the river does to not only to bring water to the field so you, the farmers can plant their crops and those sorts of things, but it's transportation. It's, it's uh, you know, it, it's so many different things. Um, when I was about, oh, I must have been 11 or 12 years old, um, my, my father and my grandfather packed my, my, my little brother and I up, and we drove to the coast of Oregon. We went salmon fishing. And it's not the best picture in the world, but you can see the, the salmon there trying to swim upstream. And I thought, well, that's strange. Why do salmon, you know, when they go to spawn, why do they go all the way upstream? Anybody know why they do that? Yeah, they go back to, to, where, to where they were spawned. Why do they do that, though? To make babies. But why, why go back to that same spot? Can't they, can't they go make babies out in the ocean where they're happy? Or down in the river wherever? They don't. For some reason, they, they feel that, that natural instinct to return back to, their, return back to their roots. And so that's what I want to talk about today is, is kind of like this, this, this fish here, swimming against the current, swimming back upstream, and why that's so important from a, from a technical standpoint with, with Linux distributions. A um, little bit more about my background. I went off to university, um, went to Utah State, got a degree in electrical engineering. Um, while I was doing my electrical engineering work, I started doing computer work. Okay, they weren't quite that old-fashioned. But one of the best classes I had was a, a class on Unix and how Unix works and learning to, to use the Unix tools. So that just kind of opened my eyes. Um, that's when I learned to use VI. 
And I learned that if I looked at my fingers, that my fingers just didn't work right for Emacs. I just didn't, couldn't do that Vulcan neck pinch on the keyboard to make Emacs work for me. So I'm, yeah, I'm a VI fan. But really what the, it did is it, is it opened up my world. I decided, no, I really don't want to do circuit boards anymore. I don't want to do electronics. I don't want to build robots. What I really want to do is be a Unix wizard. And so I kind of changed my career path. I got into to, to Linux in a big way, got into systems administration. Um, had the, was very lucky to get hired on at a little company called Omniture, which got bought out by Adobe a couple of years ago. Um, got to manage a, a, a little server farm of about 6,500 servers. And that's where I really learned there's a difference between, okay, I threw Linux on a box and here's how to fiddle around with it, or here's how to really build something that works and works well and is well engineered from a Linux standpoint. Um, and a lot of the way, along the way, I got a lot of you know, really good hands-on introduction to things like databases and database administration, you know, storage, clustering of servers, high availability, you know, load balancing, those, those sorts of things as well. Um, after that, I took a little break, took a little detour in my career, um, got into voice over IP in a big way, um, got into the asterisk open source voice over IP project, and I think there's a couple of different presentations on asterisk here tomorrow. Um, ended up writing an O'Reilly book on Asterisk, um, teaching a bunch of Asterisk classes. Um, was the community manager and the training manager at, at Digium, which is kind of the commercial sponsor of, of the Asterisk project. And had fun with that for a number of years. And then last summer, um, Paul Frields, who was the Fedora project leader at the time, uh, announced that he was, uh, he was gonna pass that baton on to somebody else, which happens very regularly in Fedora every couple of years. And, I don't know if he tricked me into thinking I wanted the job or I tricked him into thinking I was qualified for the job, but somehow uh, I ended up as the, as the Fedora project leader. So what does that mean really to be the Fedora project leader? Well, really it means you're the, you're the, the guy with a big target on your back. You know, you're the guy that ultimately responsible for everything that happens in Fedora. Now, it's an interesting role because as the Fedora project leader, do I have anybody who works for me? No. Can I tell people what to do? They don't have to listen to me. So it's a, it's a role with lots and lots of responsibility and very little power. And so really my, my number one tool that I use as the Fedora project leader is persuasion. I have to go out and show people, I think this is the right way to go. Do you agree with me? And if they agree, then I go, okay, we're working together. And if they say no, then I say, okay, now we've got to find some compromise or we've got to work this out to, to be able to move forward. And so we move forward. So let's talk about software communities. Let's talk about open source software in particular. Where does software start? Let's go to my analogy of a river for a minute here. Where does a river start? At the source. At the source. Usually there's a spring or you know, something like that, that. That's where the river starts, right? How do rivers start out? Very small. Very, pretty, pretty small, right? Just a little trickle. Is that like software? Does software usually start out with a thousand programmers starting on it all at once? And <laughs> if only. Yeah. Is it usually done design by committee, at least for the first couple of versions? How does software start? In a garage. In a garage? Somebody tinkering in, in their spare time. Man, I wish I had a program that did, you know? Necessity is the mother of invention, right? So it starts out small. It starts out with a little trickle. Somebody has a great idea, and maybe they're lucky, and their friend says, hey, yeah, that's a great idea, too. I want to help. And if you're really lucky, you get past those, those first couple of people, and you get three or four people following, and then you get a real, you know, a real thing going. You get these, these, these little streams merging together, and you start to, to create creeks and rivers uh, and that sort of thing. And then we start talking about software communities. So let me ask this question. What's a community? A group of like-minded individuals. Here's what, what some people may argue is a community in Europe. Is that a community? Or is that just a bunch of houses that happen to be geographically close to each other? Have you ever thought about what communities you're a part of? I think I'm more a part of some online communities that I'm part of than I am in my own neighborhood in my, yeah, in my neighborhood in Virginia. So what is a community? It's, it's like-minded individuals. Ah, working towards a common goal, that might be, that might be interesting, huh? So, I'm always reminded, somebody gave uh, Linus Torvalds uh, a, 
a, a newspaper interview, oh, I think it's been five or six years ago now, and somebody asked him, you know, what's the state of the Linux community? How's the Linux community doing? Anybody heard this interview before? It's actually really good. He, Linus Torvald said, well, I think you've got it all wrong. There is no Linux community. He says there's a bunch of different people using Linux, and some for their own selfish interests, but there's not just one thing called the community that you can go point your finger at and say, ah, that's the community over there. It's just people using the software for their own selfish interests. It's an interesting definition. I don't quite agree with all of it, but it, makes, it, it, it certainly makes you think. Um, my preferred definition of a, of a community is a table. It's a table that everybody can come to, sit down at the table, share ideas, Share concepts. Hey, wouldn't it be great if, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's, let's do that too. No, no, maybe we better do it this way. And so it's really just a place where people come and sit down and talk. One of the things I love about events like Self and some of the other Linux conferences I go to is there's always food. There's always people that either go out to dinner or go out to a bar or whatever, right? There's always a chance to sit down across the table and share ideas with other people. That's what community is all about. It's about the, the, the human bonds that we form, the friendships that we form, the trust that we form one, you know, one person with another. And yeah, the software helps us too, and, and, but it's really, it's really about the, the, the human network that we build as we're, as we're using software and we're, as we're trying to push software forward. Now, in typical open source fashion, sometimes we spend more time talking about, well, what's the shape of the table? How many seats should there be at the table? What color should the table be? Should we hide the, hide the table under a bike shed? Um, those sorts of discussions, right? But really, community is all about sitting down, sharing ideas, and hopefully being able to communicate those ideas in a, in a way that people are edified and not just offended. Okay? So my next que question. If you have some software, what's kind of the next step up from there? Well, typically, you have some sort of Distribution, right? So what's a distribution? So just a CD that somebody sends to you every six months or you download the ISO image off the internet every six months and burn onto a CD. Is it just bits and bytes? Or is there more to it than that? What kind of, what kind of things go into a distribution besides just bits and bytes? I think, I think that's a great definition, you know? Too many times I think we look at the individual packages maybe that go into, into an operating system and we can talk about the, you know, the, the pros and cons of, of different packaging formats or why packaging formats are important. I'm guessing most of the people here probably already know about RPMs and dev packages and, and those sorts of things and understand that package management is usually a good thing. It causes a little headache at times, but, uh, but it's generally a good, uh, a good thing. It makes it easy to install software, uninstall software, know what software you know, installed a particular file, um, make things repeatable, which is, a, which is a very useful thing. Hey, I did this, these five steps today, and I do these five steps tomorrow, I'm going to get the same result. That's always a good thing, right? But, you know, packages. I think a software distribution has to be more than just a collection of packages. Um, I think, you know, uh, the, the way I see it is that really Linux distributions serve three main purposes um, when it comes to packages. One is they aggregate. They take a bunch of packages and they put them together. But it's not just about aggregation, it's also about collation. How many people here have gone to a public library? I think everybody has, right? What's the point of a public library? Is it to have every single book that's out there available? Yeah, easily findable. Maybe you can, they have, they have loan programs where they, if, if, the, if the, you know, the library the next town down has it, they can, they can ship it to that library so that you can use it. So it's about having the right set of books in that location and helping people if the, if the book isn't there, easily find it. And then I think the third point, so it's aggregation, it's, it's collation. I think um, the, the, the third um, main point is integration. So instead of just having a, collection of packages, maybe you have a particular set of packages that work well together, 
have some kind of unified look and feel and design to them. Um, there's some thought about how do the different packages plug together. There's a lot of integration work that, that goes on. So, so integration is a, is a key part of, of why Linux distributions exist and, and why they're so important. So it's kind of like this you know, set of Legos. It's not just the individual blocks, but it's what, you know, what comes out of that is bigger than just the, 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 the sum of the parts. So that's kind of a nice high-level overview of, of why Linux distributions are important. Um, but obviously, it's more complicated than that in real life, right? It's nice to talk in theory up here. I am you know, head in the clouds kind of thing. But, it, but it's really more complicated than that. So I want to take it just one level deeper here and talk about how do Linux distributions work with and interact with and hopefully help upstream software communities. So I say upstream. We get, first of all, I've got to talk about this concept. Again, going back to my analogy of a river, talk about upstream versus downstream. So let's talk about upstream first. What's upstream? Well, in, in, in software communities, that's where the, where the software began. In a river, it's where the river starts, right? So upstream is the, the source of the, the software, the people writing the software, the people changing the software as it goes through revisions. You know, software doesn't exist in a vacuum. It changes, it grows, it's a living, breathing animal. So upstream is where that software begins. It's the development community. The opposite end of that is downstream. Now we all know where downstream is for a river. It's gonna flow into a lake or it's gonna flow into an ocean, that sort of thing, right? What's downstream for a software project? Well, that's your end users, right? They're not the ones developing the software, they're the ones that are the consumers of that software. So everybody understand this, this analogy I'm using of upstream and downstream? So what we end up with, again, a little oversaturated on the picture there, but this idea of different people are at different places in the river. Some people are closer to upstream, like the gal up there in the front. Some people are a little further downstream, okay? So just as an example, the, the distribution I care most about, Fedora, has a policy of following upstream very, very closely. Um, in the early days of Fedora, it wasn't quite that, it wasn't quite like that. And we found through painful experience that trying to maintain a million patches so that we didn't have to follow upstream was not a sustainable model. And so we, we, we made a conscious decision as a distribution, we want to follow upstream as much as possible with a few exceptions, but that, that's, our, that's our general principle. So what we really end up with is if you look at this gal up here in the picture, at the front of the picture, she's, she's fairly close to the upstream. Um, and, uh, and then you have other distributions that kind of follow and look what Fedora does and, and stay a little further downstream from that. Uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux being a good example of that. So in Fedora, we're kind of you know, charting, charting the waters there. We're, 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 we're in the lead saying, hey, what's new? You know, doing some technology incubation, doing some, placing some technology bets and say, hey, we're gonna try this and this and this and see what works and what doesn't. And then other distributions like Red Hat Enterprise Linux or some of the you know, derivatives of that or other distributions kind of keep an eye on, oh yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was in Fedora and that worked well, so we'll, we'll incorporate it in. One of my favorite things is, is to be at a conference and somebody says, hey, I really, really like such and such feature in, in this Linux distribution. And then somebody else says, oh yeah, that was in Fedora first. So have you guys heard of Fedora's four foundations? Features, friends, first, and what am I forgetting? Freedom. So first, being first is, is something we, we, t we take pride on in, in, in Fedora. Um, I actually really, really like this picture. I wish you could see it a little bit better um, because it's at a really, really interesting place in the world. Um, on the Continental Divide uh, in Wyoming, there's a creek called uh, Two Oceans Pass Creek. Got a terrible name. But the interesting thing about this creek is just oh, a little, oh, maybe a mile from where this picture was taken, um, the creek actually splits in two right along the Continental Divide. It's going along and it splits in two. And it goes into what's called Pacific Creek, where this picture was taken, on one side and it goes into Atlantic Creek on the other. On this side, on Pacific Creek, it goes from, from Pacific Creek into the Snake River, into the Columbia River, and out to the Pacific Ocean. On the Atlantic Creek side, it goes into Atlantic Creek, it goes into the Yellowstone River, into the Missouri River, into the Mississippi River, into the Gulf of Mexico, and 
eventually out to the Atlantic. And the reason I like that as, as an analogy here is the further upstream you are, the more control you have over what happens from, from an end user perspective with the software. The further downstream you are, you have very little control. You're just a, you're just a user. You basically take what's, what's given to you by upstream. And that's one of the reasons why I think Linux distributions really have a duty to follow upstream as much as possible, to, to have the, the best possible chance of, of making a positive, sustainable, long-term impact on, on the end user. Anyway, I like that picture. Now, what else do distributions do? Um, I hope that over the next few minutes I can talk about you know, how to focus on, on what's important to a Linux distribution. I find, I find the word focus to, to really you know, put things in perspective. Too, too often times a lot of us walk around like this with, with, with blinders on. And so I like to t tell people, let's, let's zoom out a little bit. Let's take a little higher view and see what, what other things Linux distributions do to really help upstream communities. Um, first of all, I think the, one of the number one things that isn't talked about with open source software is why do people get involved? I think, I think this, this has a lot to do with it. It's not necessarily for the money. It's not necessarily for, the, for being able to put something on your resume. People feel proud to be able to help out with something that's bigger than themselves. And I think that's one of the primary motivators that doesn't often get talked about a lot in, in open source circles. So one of the things that distributions do is they give people a, a sense of pride, a, a, a sense of belonging, a sense of, hey, I'm working on something that's bigger than myself, and look how awesome it is. I just played this little teeny tiny role here, but I'm part of something bigger. And so I think that's, a, that's an important thing. Another important thing that, that distributions do is they act like this little city of Ardmore, Oklahoma, where they say we're building an inclusive community. Distributions try to reach out to lots of different people. Um, I know inside of Fedora, it's, 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 there's no end of, uh, of the debate when we talk about, well, there's people using Fedora for servers, there's people that want it just for the desktop, there's people that want it for design, or some people want it for electronics design, some people want to create music with it, some people want to create websites with it, um, some people want to use Fedora in the cloud. Um, there's a lot of different people with different objectives, different backgrounds coming together in the distribution. And I think that's a very healthy thing. I think if everybody in Fedora thought exactly like I did, that Fedora would be a pretty boring distribution. And so I think that variety really helps out, but we want to be inclusive as well. And it's not just about people writing software. You know? in, in, in Fedora, for example, we need packagers, but we need designers, we need release engineers, we need people willing to do translation, we need people willing to do documentation, we need people willing to do marketing. And you know, open source marketing is a weird thing we could talk about. In, you know, and if, if there's time, but we need people from all different backgrounds, all different perspectives to help us make Fedora better. We need to be training today the future leaders for our distribution tomorrow. And I think you know, that's the only, only way we're gonna be able to sustain the growth, the only way we're gonna be able to continue advancing is not just say it's the same 10 people that were working on it last year that are working on it this year, but have those 10 people train 10 more or 20 more, and then have those 20 train 200 and go from there. Um, I find it interesting if I ask people, so, so I'm gonna ask you just for the fun of it. How many people here started using Linux entirely on their own? How many people here started using Linux because a friend or a neighbor or a relative said, hey, you gotta check this out, this is kinda of interesting. I know that's how I got started. If it hadn't been for a friend in college that says, hey, I know you're taking this Unix class, but here's this free stuff you can download and use all the same Unix tools. You can do all your homework on this for free instead of having to go into the lab at school. I probably, you know, I might have found it eventually, but I certainly wouldn't have got, in, got started when I did. Um, it was really because of a friend that, that, that got me started in it. Now, again, I want to go back to this concept. It's not just about the technology. It's as much about the relationships, you know, the, the friends we have, the, the people we talk to, um, as it is just the bits and the bytes that, that make a distribution. The next kind of role that a, that a software distribution plays is that of having a bunch of tools. The whole reason we use computers is why? To get stuff done, right? It's a whole lot easier to get stuff done if you have the right tools. Um, my dad does a lot of woodworking, and he always taught me as I was growing up that having the right tool 
is half the job, right? So I think a lot of us feel very comfortable with the tools that we have in, in our, our, our preferred distribution. Um, here's, here's, here's a set of tools for a guy that likes to upgrade electric, electric guitars. Um, he has all the right tools he needs to go upgrade that electric guitar. Think, I want you to think about your, your preferred Linux distribution. What is it about that that you really like? And I'll bet you a lot of it is it has the tools you need and you're comfortable with the way that those, that the way, the way that those tools are, are presented. Okay? Um, some of the more you know, touchy-feely parts of a, of a Linux distribution, um, Linux distributions, again, tend to be a gathering place, but they also tend to be a schoolhouse where people can learn new things. Um, I'm constantly amazed at how many smart people hang out in my particular distribution and how much I can learn from them. Just because I'm the Fedora project leader doesn't mean I'm an expert at, at either Linux or, or at Fedora, thank goodness, because um, I never would have been qualified for the job if that were the case. Um, but it's a great opportunity for learning. There's so much out there, and there's so many people out there willing to, to, to show you how to, how to do things. Um, that it's, a, it's really a tremendous opportunity from a, from a self-improvement and, and, and growth standpoint. Um, so, so take advantage of those opportunities. Um, they're, they're out there, they're available, all it takes is, is a little effort. I know for myself, sometimes it's hard to say, I get in a rut and I say, ah, I'm perfectly happy with what I know and what I'm doing right now. It's hard to break out of that and say, oh, I gotta go learn something new, I gotta try something different. Let me try a different tool to see if it works better than what I'm than what I'm used to. And yes, every once in a while I do try Emacs just to, just to, just to try to break out of that shell. So um, there's that. Another thing I really, really like about Linux distributions in particular um, is the, the chance for cross-pollination. You've got so many smart people, but smart people from different backgrounds with different disciplines. I think one of the great things about the information age and things that we've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years is that Computers and technology have really allowed people to be creative and, and take an idea from here and an idea from here and have the tools they need to rapidly prototype a business, rapidly prototype a, um, a, a, a you know, whatever it is that they happen to be working on, whether it's a piece of code or a website or, or, or those sorts of things, and, and do some really amazing things. Not because they were impossible to do before, just the tools weren't there. I think, you know, I look at what's happening with cloud computing. It's not that somebody can't go up, go out and buy a bunch of servers and build themselves a little data center in their office. We've probably all done that. You know, cloud computing just makes it easier where you don't have to, you don't have to be an expert at building a data center to, to go out and, and, and build a big database or build a big website or build a big application. You let somebody else worry about what they're good at and you focus on what, what you're good at. Um, I love the, the, the opportunities that, that Linux distributions give you to, to, to cross-pollinate and, and share ideas with people from different backgrounds. Um, obviously, a big portion of what Linux distributions do deals with communication. And, you know, they have tons of mailing lists and forums and IRC channels and, and ways to communicate. I, I, I always wonder, though, if, if we're fighting this war a little bit uh, a, a little bit off center if we're more focused on the, the quantity of the communication rather than the quality of the communication. I think if, if open source in general has a, has a, black, out, a black eye out there in the, you know, in, in the industry, it's probably because of this. I think you know, people in open source tend to be very smart. Sometimes they tend to be very opinionated as well. I worry sometimes about from, from people who aren't used to the open source way of doing things, that aren't used to people being upfront and frank and, and direct at, at times. Um, you know, I wonder, I wonder how, how we could do a better job of, of putting our best foot forward, um, showing, showing the potential we have without coming, coming off as a bunch of, you know, To, to, to put it bluntly, coming off as a bunch of snotty kids who don't shave and, and, and have no social life. I hate to put it in such blunt terms, but you know, sometimes that's, that's, that's the way we come off. So we, you know, I, I, I encourage you to think about communication and what are, what are ways that we can um, 
improve the way that we communicate one with another. Um, I've certainly um, tried to do that as the Fedora project leader. I've actually reached out to several of the other Linux distributions um, to say, what can, what can we do to communicate better between the li different Linux distributions? Um, we're not all the same. We all have, have our different um, focuses. We, we all have our different strengths and weaknesses, but we need to improve the way we communicate one with another. Um, so, so I encourage you to think about that. I, I can't see that picture very well. That's security cameras. Um, one of the things I care deeply about in Fedora, and I hope other Linux distributions do as well, is being open and, and as transparent as possible. Um, you, know, none, you know, none of us lives in isolation. We're all um, communicating with one another. We're sharing with one another. And I think it's very, very important for, uh, for Linux distributions to be as open and transparent as possible in the way that, that, not only in the way that the software gets built and put together, but the, the kind of the decisions, the, the bureaucracy and the politics that goes into putting a, a distribution together. Um, that's something I've, I've pushed very, very hard for in Fedora, making sure that if we're, if we're going to have a meeting, either the meeting's going to be out in the open and, and, and you know, there's going to be logs available so that people can see what we're, what we're doing. Or if there's a reason we can't do it in public, we're going to tell people this is why we're meeting in private and this is, this is why we can't share it. Uh, luckily, we have very few, um, very few reasons not to have our, our, our meetings in public so that people can know what's, what's going on. But um, I think that's, that, that helps build trust. Again, going back to the kind of the human side of things, it's not just about putting packages on a CD and shipping them out. It's really about building these relationships of trust between the core people that are helping to, to build that distribution because that's the sustainable model. Um, we shouldn't have, you know, we, we should be so open and transparent in everything that we do that we don't leave room for misunderstanding. Um, obviously, Linux distributions and, and, and you know, any, any technical forum in general um, give people a, a chance to stand up on their soapbox and, and, and shout, you know, um, Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's not such a good thing. Um, you can't tell what that is. It's a meat grinder. Um, you know, open source, um, the, the, the free software development model is not the most efficient way to get things done. It just happens to be the only one that works over the long term, you know? And sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes it's like watching sausage being made. It's, it, it's not a pretty thing, but it works. And I think, you know, I think if you look at software development in general, um, it's, it's a model that's sustainable. So we don't expect things to be perfect in version one or version two or maybe even version three. We're really a work in progress. We have things that we're striving for. We know that we're going to get partway there with this release and then we're going to have another release and it's a little further, further gets us a little further down the road and we're going to, you know, we're going to have to adjust where we go from time to time but it's about continual improvement. We're gonna be better tomorrow than we were today. Um, now, people often you know, ask me as the Fedora project leader, what's, what is it that I worry most about? You know, who's our enemy? Who, who, who am I really worried about out there? Um, if you would have asked me you know, 10 years ago who I thought the enemy of, of, of free and open source software was, I probably would have said, oh, some large evil corporation that's going to come you know, squash us all and take away our software. Um, if you would have asked me um, maybe five years ago, I probably would have said, oh, that other, that other Linux distribution, you know, they're our enemy. Um, they're the ones we're fighting against. Um, if you ask me today who I think the enemy is, I would say we found the enemy and he is us. Um, I think, you know, speaking, speaking you know, my, own, my own private opinion here, I think Fedora's biggest enemy right now is Fedora, is within Fedora. I think the biggest, um, I think the biggest battles we as humans fight are within the, you know, within our coconuts up here. Um, and I'm more worried about how we treat the people inside our own group than I am necessarily about some large evil corporation or some, some other Linux distribution. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what concerns me. And I, you know, if, if, you, if you're a member of Fedora, please um, take this as, a, as an opportunity to reflect on, on, on how we treat each other inside of Fedora. If you're a member of another you know, Linux distribution or several other Linux distributions, think about how you communicate one with another, how you treat each other, 
if we're all in this together, how are we gonna, gonna go out and, and grow and, and, and conquer the Goliaths that are out there um, if we can't take care of our own? Um, so I throw that out there for thought. Um, I think too many times um, we throw out barriers that don't need to be there. Um, it's hard enough to learn Linux. It's hard enough to learn the open source methodology. It's har hard enough to, to understand philosophically what does it mean to be free software. We don't need to throw up barriers in people's way to make that harder than it needs to be. Um, and I could, I, I could tell lots of examples. I could tell lots of examples from my, from my own life. Um, when I first got started in, in voice over IP with the Asterisk project, uh, you know, I saw that there was this cool voice over IP project on the internet and it sounded interesting and, and I had some free time so I tried to dive into it. And I started asking around, hey, can somebody give me a hand? Is there documentation? And somebody in an IRC channel says, ah, if you're not smart enough to just go read the source code and figure it out, we don't want you here. Now, I know a lot of people, you know, would have balked at that and said, oh, I don't want to be there if that's the attitude people have. I, I took that as a challenge and ended up getting into it. But um, I think too many times we throw up those, those, those barriers. Oh, you don't know how to use VI? You, you don't need to be here. You don't, need, you don't, know, you don't use Emacs? Oh, you don't need to be here. Or, oh, you can't, you can't figure out how to find that in the man page? You don't need to be here. I think we throw up these artificial barriers in people's way to try to keep them out. It's not about keeping people out. If, if, if I teach 10 other people how to use this software, that doesn't mean there's less for me. It's not a zero-sum game. Um, you know? I can't tell you how many people I've introduced to Linux and five years down the road, I'm going to them saying, hey, can you help me? You understand this much better than I ever learned it. Can you, can you show me how to do this, this particular thing? It's not a zero-sum game. So we, we need to you know, have as many people as possible helping us out. We need to do whatever we can to tear down these artificial barriers. To, to the, keep people from being able to progress. Obviously, there's lots of different things we can tweak. There's lots of different knobs we can tweak. Now, anybody here into, into audio? Have any audio files in the room? What if you had a nice mixer like that and I came up to it and says, oh, that's interesting. Tw changed about 20 or 30 knobs all at once. Wouldn't make you happy, would it? But that's what we do as geeks. We want to go twist all the knobs, <laughs> right? Of course. So how do, we, how do we get past that? Um, one of the things, that's one of the things I had to learn very, very early on as the Fedora project leader is let's be very measured, let's be very deliberate. And yes, we're gonna tweak some knobs, but we're gonna turn them one at a time and then we're gonna wait for some feedback and then we're gonna turn another one and we're gonna wait for some feedback. We can't be doing this all day or, or we'll never find the right answer. There's just too many variables in it all. Um, last but not least here, I think the most important thing that Linux distributions need to do is use their ears and listen. I think a lot of us spend a lot of our time talking and sometimes not so much listening. I think there's a, there's a good reason that the Lord gave me one mouth and two, two ears. <coughs> and uh, I, I, I certainly, you know, Need, need to listen more. And I think in, in general, in open source, we, we need to listen more. Um, not only to listen to um, complaints, but to listen to praise as well. Um, I think sometimes in, in open source communities, maybe we're a little selfish. I think some of us get this, this attitude of, oh, I'm entitled to this because it's out there and I can do it and I can express my opinion. Um, and we don't ever think to, to say thank you when something works well. We'll go file a bug report or complain on a mailing list if something's broken. But how many times do we take the time to say, you know what, I used your piece of software and it just worked, thank you. Or hey, I read this documentation you wrote and it helped me get past this hurdle I had, thank you. So it's, it's, it's listening and then, and, and then giving people appropriate feedback as you, as you find those sorts of things. Um, and I guess you might ask, ask the question, well why? Why go to all this extra effort? Why go, go to the extra effort to, to try to swim against the current? Why try to go to all that extra effort to be careful about the way we communicate? Why go to all that extra effort to try to mentor other people um, in what we're doing? Why go to all that extra effort to walk that extra mile? Why? Because we all live downstream. Just like you wouldn't want your neighbor pouring motor oil down the rain, you know, down the gutters. 
we all live downstream, right? We're all end users of this very software that we're, we're trying to make better. And so that's why, it, that's why it's worth it. That's why we have to take that, that concerted effort um, to swim against the current, to do, to do the things that are right. You know? Anything that's worthwhile is going to be difficult. It's not easy to do these things, but it's the only way forward. So I, I share with that's that's my vision of, of what Linux distributions need to do and should be doing, and in, in most cases are doing, to make upstream communities stronger. Now, I don't have all the answers. In fact, you guys, you guys in this room are probably 10 times smarter than I am. But I want you to think about those sorts of things. And I'm happy to answer questions if, if people have questions that I can answer. But um, more importantly, I think I invite you to go out and ask questions of other people and say, what, what can you learn from, from other people? But I'll, I'll, we've got a few minutes here. Um, I'll open it up for questions and answers, either, either on the topic of open source distributions, on, on, on Fedora in general, if you want questions about voice over IP, you know, I, you know, I'm happy to answer questions about VI or XML or technical documentation or, you know. <laughs> exactly. So questions. So the enemy is less kind of realization. Is that something you knew coming in as a Fedora project leader or something you realized after you, after you were there? Uh -huh. so, the, so the question is, this slide I had earlier, let me see if I can find it here where I said, you know, that really the enemy is us. Um, was that a, realiza a realization I had after becoming the, the Fedora project leader or was that something that I, that I, that I found out afterward? No, that was something I, I, I knew full well. Um, from my many years in Fedora before I became the Fedora project leader. Um, and I don't think that's anything that's, that's you know, special about Fedora. I saw the same thing in asterisk and voice over IP. I saw that same thing in, in you know, many of the other you know, open source communities that I, that I deal with. But yeah, no. to answer your question, no, I, I walked into the job with my eyes wide open knowing, knowing what was involved there. I think everybody's gotten the read the manual response Read the manual, even if, it's, even if it doesn't exist, even if it's out of date, even if it's not quite right. Yeah, because that's the easy answer, right? That's, that's the, I'm too busy, you know. Don't, don't, don't bother me answer. We got, we've got to get past that. We've got to, we've got to find a way to, to, to be better. Let's highlight a problem with open source in general. Everybody degenerates to the two-word response emails when you get to key equals the new jerk. I mean, it happens with every project. There's a gradual, somebody starts with very lengthy, very explanatory emails. They take a leadership role within the project, and eventually they get, they get flooded in emails, and they don't delegate, and they try to answer all of them themselves, and they get shorter and shorter and shorter, and then they end up with the RTF and the answer. It's, I've seen it over and over and over. And that's why, you, that's why, like you said, the first two guys are training the next 20. Mm -hmm. Because you do, I mean, everyone, everyone in all these open source, everyone, you're the only salary in Fedora. So, I mean, all these people are volunteering their time to, to generate this massive product. I'm not the only salary, right. but there's, there's a few of us. Yeah. Yes, there's a very, very finite right. number of us. The vast majority of the Fedora project is volunteer effort. That's correct. And, and for every open source mm -hmm. community, everything I contribute to is in my own time when I could be hanging out with my wife. You know, you, burnout is inevitable. And so you have to be training your replacement mm -hmm. and, and looking for the next people to, to take that torch. Yep. And, and, and I'll be honest, mentorship is very, very hard. And there was, a, there was a, an interesting article, I, I wish I had the link right here, that came out in the past week or so. Um, I'm trying to think who, who it was that, that wrote it. But anyway, they were talking about mentorship, and particularly in mentorship in open source communities. And about 60 to 70, 80% of the time, it fails. So with, with, you know, with those kind of efforts, you may have to mentor five different people before you get that one that actually catches on and gets it and, 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 and can continue on where you left off. It's, and they're all getting two word emails too. So it's a, it, it, it's a very hard problem to solve. That being said, it's absolutely worth it. And where you see it and it works and it works well it is absolutely a beautiful thing to see, have people catch that vision and say, aha, I finally see what you're seeing. Now I wanna go do it and catch that excitement. And we've all seen it, right? You've seen that the person that comes in and says, I'm really excited to do something. Oh, now I don't fit in and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm treading water. And then they catch that vision and like, ah, I get it now. I know how to swim. There's, there's a 
possible to at least two x trying to explain to somebody else how to do something versus doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. This is not this is uh, this is not something specific to open source. Right. This is in engineering, this is in management, this is in you know everywhere. And I think people have to be trained in order to understand how to do that and why it's a good benefit to do it. Mm -hmm. How, 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 yes. <laughs> how, how else do I respond to that? <laughs> One step too far. <laughs> but no, I think I think that's I think that's a great analogy. You know, I think I. I Right. And, and, I, and I think we all, all have a, a, some certain level of confirmation bias built into our lives these days because we listen to the music we want to listen to, we read the mailing list that we want to read to, we subscribe to the RSS feeds that we want to read. And so we have enough of it that's tailor-made for how we are. I think that's a great, uh, a great thing that we need to work on is, is listen to people who, who have different opinions than what we have. Try to reach out to somebody who's different and, and try to see things from their point of view. And I, I, think, I think that would serve us all well. You've been doing it for so long, you don't realize you have to explain that step in the, in, in the process. And there's no one right answer. There's no easy way to solve that problem. And I think more than, maybe more than, than saying that mentorship is, a, is a, a hard effort or documentation is an effort, I think they're a mindset. I think if you have a mindset of being a mentor, if you have a mindset of, of that documentation is important and, and, and that repeatability is important, then you're going to do those things as you're doing your, your everyday work that help make it easier to document things, that help make it easier to, to do mentorship. It's, yeah, it still requires effort, but having the mindset has to, you know, has to be there first. You're never gonna take the effort and feel good about the effort if you don't have the mindset that that's important to begin with. Otherwise, it's just a drudgery. Nobody likes a drudgery. It doesn't have to be. I've, I've participated in documentations in several, in several different groups, in Fedora, in, in, in Asterisk, and several other, other communities where it's been fun.
first time, you're like, aha, <laughs> I just spent six hours on that, and now I know how to do it. And if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, everyone else knows, and I put it on the wiki now, and I'm still like, awesome, good job I'm, on me. Like, you know, but not later. Like, later, you're like, fuck, I don't even remember what I did. And yep. And, and that's another thing with mentorship. As you're teaching someone new how to do something, watch for the places where they fall down or they fail, and that's where you need better documentation. And so it doesn't, it doesn't have to be you, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm an expert now, and now I can go through the drudgery of, of, of writing the documentation down. It should be part of that exploration phase when you're learning something new. Jot down some notes so that you can help, help document that. And it doesn't have to be formal, you know, 12 paragraphs, you know, long explanations. You know, we have things like wikis and things like that make it very easy to, 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 to start out small and have other people collaborate and help make it better along the way. How many communities have like a defined process for onboarding? I mean, it's something you do in the corporate culture all the time. New employee joins, defined process to go through. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things you can do with hiring engineers within like the first two weeks, I say, I want you to document everything that you had to go ask somebody else how to do. Right, so I mean, how bad are we if people come down to speak? And, and I don't find that in a lot of communities. I mean, we tend to sort of let it be self-directed research. I'm just wondering if people had good experience in, with other ways. In in Fedora specifically, in certain parts, we do have you know formal mentoring processes like becoming a a a, 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 a software packager in Fedora or becoming an ambassador in Fedora. We tend to have a fairly good structured you know onboarding processes there. That but some. That uh, we try this not to slam on you guys at all. It's just there's so much process in in the bunch is the same way to try to like swallow it one time. You're just like it 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 is difficult. Um, it's hard to get through. It, it is hard to get through, especially for somebody who, are, who, who if you're not sitting there face to face with them, if you're trying to interact with them over email or, or IRC, it's, it, it's, it's much harder to do. Um, I wish there was a, an, a simple solution to that. One thing I found, um, I was at, at one of our FUDCON conferences in, in Panama a couple of weeks ago, and I found that we had a HackFest session there where we just sat people down and said, anybody who started through the packaging process but never got sponsored because they didn't finish this up, we're going to have people here that can answer your questions and help you get squared away right here. Um, you know, and, and having places where people can come in person and do those sorts of things seems to help a lot more than just trying to add more process to it over email or, or IRC or you know, yeah, tickets or those sorts of things. And I think that's, you know, I think that goes down, I'm, I'm just about out of time, but I think that goes to the, what really is the open source way, and that is if you want something done, you either scratch your own itch, you convince somebody else to scratch your itch for you, or you convince somebody else that it really is their itch and get them to, <laughs> to do it. But, but, but that's what it is. And so things like documentation, encouraging people to say, hey, go scratch your own itch. If that sentence doesn't seem right to you, You've got the power. Be bold. You know, we can always revert it later. We've got a history. You know, go, 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 change that. Encouraging people to be bold and not timid as they as they join a, you know, try and try something new is also you know an important part of that as well. It's not just us, us as the mentors that that need to do all the work. People joining the, you know, joining in and trying something new need to know. You know, we got backups and stuff. Be bold. Go, go, be try okay, something be new. Be okay with failure. Be okay with failure. Accept failure. Failure is how we grow. Failure is how we learn. Anyway, I'm out of time. Thanks, thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. If you have other, qu other questions. Um, oops. My email address is up there. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me at the conference or, or drop me an email. I'm happy to, happy to help you out. Thank you. I can help with like that. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? You gave me a I good found idea. problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with that. Really cool with that. Let's, Let's put the word out. out.
As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.